webinar today is about the work we've done on soil health and the soil health work that we are continuing to do and just give you an update on what our soil health test is all about and, and how to use it. Uh, I'm going to begin with talking a little bit about uh, how we got started and how this this whole uh, project gets started and some of the, the history of the last few years on just how we got into this. Um, we basic, basically, we're looking at improving agriculture, um, looking at feeding the civilization ahead and what we need to do to do a better job of growing healthy crops. Again, obviously productive land, including my understanding of microorganisms, quality seeds and water and all the inputs we need, uh, fertilizer and, and plant protection uh, products to do the job correctly. When we talk about production agriculture, we start off with what we classify as a first green revolution where the Peruvians actually harvested back in the 80, 1800s um, bird droppings and used them for fertilizer um, to grow crops uh, and mining that 20 million tons of bird guano uh, for a number of years eventually it actually exhausted some of the reserves and they actually became regulated and people started looking for other other options. The second green revolution happened later in, after the war. A lot of ammunition, uh, ammonium nitrate fertilizers that were used in making bombs and munitions was available and we started using that in production agriculture. We also had the introduction of uh, cereal, better cereal varieties and shorter straw strength, uh, straw lengths, uh, the use of phosphates and then again a big influx of agricultural chemicals for weed control and pest control. So that was kind of the start of the Green Revolution and, and it continued on for a, a number of decades. Uh, in 2013, uh, an individual by the name of Bennett actually coined the phrase the Evergreen Revolution and looking at the start of a whole new revolution in production agriculture, looking at the molecular and microbial ecology of the rhizosphere and understanding the plant to soil health relationship. So the question here is how do we adequately feed a population of 7 million and increasing on this planet? What do we need to do uh, with increasing populations and land bases actually shrinking? Everybody wanting to eat a better diet, a healthier diet. And again, with all the work being done on increasing the need for higher nutrient density of the food, uh, how are we going to accomplish this with uh, a limited land base? So what we can do, um, one direction was suggested that we could uh, move towards more ecological agriculture. And the reason for that is less reliance on fossil fuels and just getting better yields uh, with what resources we had. So the use of ecological ag agriculture is actually practices that require greater reliance on natural soil processes, native microorganisms, and the interactions between plants and animals and humans. Uh, basically the whole soil health initiative uh, to make it move forward. So when we talk about soil health functions, uh, we're talking about the microbial biomass and all the reserves of nutrients that it, that it creates, uh, nitrogen fixation um, from microbial activity, biological control of disease and disease suppression, uh, some of these growth promotion and biostimulation and hormones and more uh, in, in some of these uh, microbials. Looking at the whole, whole soil community and the functions, uh, what are these what are these bugs and and soil, uh, what's the soil biology actually doing? And then again, how can we manage them and cultivate them and make their existence uh, even better? So examples of ecologically based agriculture, uh, we've known for a lot of years that rhizobia ha have a big impact on on crop production and nitrogen fixation. That's a one a good example of ecological based agriculture. Another one that comes to mind is what the Brazilians did with sugarcane industry and the use of endophytic bacteria uh, for nitrogen fixation. And basically what they did is they actually found a variety of sugarcane that had the phenotypic relationship with the endophytes in the soil that would help it fix nutrients and uh, reduce the, the need for inputs. Uh, the other one is a lot of people looking at development of soils that have microorganism populations that enhance plant growth and suppress disease. We've known for a long time that rhizobia fix a lot of nitrogen. Matter of fact, the rhizobia presently being used in agriculture fix as much nitrogen as the synthetic fertilizers we apply. And this being developed in Canada has been around for a long time. And again, the reason this works is that the breeders and people looking at rhizobia look for the phenotypic relationship between the microbe and the plant that they were trying to inoculate. When we look at the differences here, and again, talk about phenotypic relationships, the one microorganism, or rhizobia being used today, this one here, 
is very aggressive, uh, withstands the pressure of the rhizosphere, and does an excellent job in providing nitrogen uh, for, for the legume. Whereas you can see here, there's a number of different rhizobium in a soil that are less effective and some that are actually slightly parasitic to the plant. Uh, so th there's, there's, there's phenotypic relationships that do exist, and, and we need to look for those. So that Brazilian model, how it actually helped uh, in, in looking at the ecology of this whole um, sugarcane production. The breeders went and selected for a form of sugarcane or a variety of sugarcane that would grow very well with very few inputs, and they put that in their breeding program. And what you see here from this whole process is that they selected and bred using um, varieties that used very little nitrogen. And again, the early research uh, utilization of microbes that supported plant growth and productivity. That was their whole key for the breeding process they put in place. How that, uh, the results of that and what it, it means to production agriculture, this is the, the input of nitrogen to produce the same biomass as any place else in the, in the world. Brazil presently uses an average of about 50 pounds of nitrogen to grow that crop, where you can see uh, other countries are substantially higher than that. And you know, the U.S. and Hawaii use you know, three to 400 pounds of N to grow the same biomass. So there's definitely a huge difference in the variety of sugar cane and, and how it relates to the microorganisms and, and cultures of those in the rhizosphere. So looking at the rhizosphere and, and what we're dealing with here, basically, as we coin now the gut of the plant, uh, this was identified back in 1903 by Hiltner, and he basically understood that the organisms in the rhizosphere were quite a bit different than the bulk soil. In other words, there was something going on here where the plant was actually cultivating a completely different group of organisms uh, in that rhizosphere. So when you look at that, uh, how is the plant changing the microbial population in the rhizosphere? How is it selecting for and, and nurturing that group of organisms? Not much has changed since 1903 until recently, and there's a lot of work being done now on understanding this, the soil biome and, and what makes things happen and the relationships between these plants. But we've got a long ways to go, and we're just basically uh, starting to understand some of this. What we do know, and why this is of big interest to us, is we know that 20 to 60 percent of all the photosynthesis a plant produces actually ends up in the rhizosphere. So the plant is expending a lot of energy to actually feed and colonize this, this rhizosphere. And, and these aren't simple compounds. They're organic acids and sugars and phenolics and all kinds of different compounds that the plant actually regulates and designs a the type of chemistry it needs to, to signal for the right organism and actually maintain that organism in that rhizosphere. And this is just a list, uh, one page out of a, a documentation of all kinds of different compounds uh, that the plant gives off. And you can see here that it is very complex. And this isn't by accident. These, these compounds are put together by the plant to actually accomplish and, and signal for and maintain a certain biological component. Dr. George Lazarza was working for the, the Agriculture Canada Federal Research Station in London here. Him and I worked together for a long, long time trying to understand some of this, uh, some of this relationship to, to soil health and disease suppression. Um, we worked together on a number of projects looking at what can we do to the chemistry of the soil and cultural practice to increase biological activity and just increase crop production. And basically, what I said to him is we need to take this to a different level. We need to start um, bringing this into production agriculture and using some of this technology. Uh, with that, uh, George resigned from uh, federal government and, and started working with me on ANL Biologicals. And those who don't know George, he's the one on the left. Before he came to me, uh, George and um, Sean Hemmingson from NRC actually looked at fingerprinting the, the microbial population of a number of different soils around the world uh, with the idea that they thought they could actually get a fingerprint that would identify where the soils came from. They quickly found out that all soils, no matter where you extract them from the globe, uh, had basically the same group of organisms in there in different, different comp, um, combinations, but all the same organisms. And some they didn't even know who they were actually uh, occurred in all soils. So applying that to some research work on potatoes, both in Ontario and in the Maritimes, they looked at what they could do to understand, in this particular case, what caused scab and how scab actually was uh, uh, could could be controlled or or 
or gotten rid of in, in potato soils. So they looked at the bog soil, and again, they listed a whole bunch of different organisms. You can see the group of organisms, and again, in both soils, although in different different combinations, uh, you can see uh, the same organisms exist. That's the bulk soil. Then they looked at the rhizosphere soil, and again, just like Hitler found out, there's a completely different um, combination of these organisms in the rhizosphere. But they took it one step further and looked at what's going on in the plant. How many of these organisms actually get into the plant as endophytes and actually do something to the plant? And one thing that became very apparent and was quite a bit of surprise is this group right here. What were rhizobium doing in a plant that was not a legume? What was the function of these organisms and why were they actually there? And again, the Ontario soils in a lot in much better shape, better productivity than the PEI soils, there was something significantly different here. Well, research lately has showed that rhizobium has a, a big control on disease and disease pressure in all kinds of plants, both soil barn and, and plant, uh, able to control and basically control these pathogens by a mechanism called uh, induction of plant defense mechanisms. And this is just another uh, article out of a publication, again, this is many pages long, showing the types of diseases and pests that can be controlled by rhizobium species that are not not uh, nodulating um, rhizobium, but actually uh, are taken up by the plant to help the plant uh, control some of these diseases and pests. Rhizobium also influences soil structure. It's, a, it's an amazing organism giving off all these exopolysaccharides which are a glue-like material that help uh, adhere the, the soil to the root system and actually have a, a, a big impact on aggregate stability within, within the soil, improve, improving uh, root mass, uh, root to shoot, um, soil ratio, uh, and again, better control of water and, and nutrient uptake in the soil. This is a photo by a good friend of mine, Mike Delinsky, where he took a cross-section of a, a wheat root and photographed it, and you can see all these soil particles actually adhering to that root through the secretion of these exopolysaccharides we just talked about. So they are a very big component in the whole overall um, function of the, of the rhizosphere. Um, basically, the plant gives off these amino acids and sugars and these compounds that glue these, these, these soil particles together, and they, they basically are a food for the micro uh, microbial activity in the rhizosphere, uh, and, and basically helping the plants uh, dissolve nutrients from those soil particles and uh, improve uh, nutrient and, and micronutrient availability. So look at the Ontario soil and PEI soils. We quickly saw some significant difference between the soil profiles and some of the, some of the organisms. Again, looking at some of the organisms we identify as good uh, organisms for soil health. And you can see in Ontario here that the percentage of what we classify as the good guys is much greater than in the PEI soil. So there's something significantly different between these soils and the plant's ability to actually sequester or attract these organisms to that rhizosphere. Uh, this is just a, a printout of some of the results we had from the scab trials, again, from the Alliston area. Scab work, much lower scab index than the PEI. But we did start seeing from this information that we could actually reduce the scab occurrence and have some control over some of these these, uh, these uh, diseases or infections through some of the chemistry that was happening in the soil. And, and that actually was published in 2007 and, and used in many countries for control of scab and potato. So in 2010, we started a and Biologicals, and, and our whole drive here was to bring some of this technology to the forefront and continue to do some research on soil health and just what it was all about. So the things we wanted to do in this research was identify the microbes that populate the host as an endophyte and the rhizosphere. Uh, how does the host actually select for these microbes? So how, is, how are these microbes being drawn into the rhizosphere? Uh, how does the host respond to them and why? What are the unique characteristics of each of these individuals and what are they doing? I mean, what are they actually doing to help this plant uh, grow and, and, and uh, in the health of the plant? And what are the forces that maintain the equilibrium among the populations? Because we're talking about a very diverse population of organisms, and, and how do we maintain the proper equilibrium? In this project very early, we had the fortunate, um, we were very fortunate to be able to work with this individual, Dean Glennie, who could produce over 300 bushel of corn in southwestern Ontario. That was quite uh, unique 
for his area, um, basically 2x uh, what the neighbors were doing. So we looked at what he was doing and, and why he, he was getting the results he was getting consistently across his farm. He had a unique way of, of farming, both corn and soybeans in rotation, very, very interested in, in low traffic movement across where the plant was growing, uh, very specific placement of nutrients in the root zone, and basically looking at all the possible things we can do to improve soil health and soil structure. George and I have always agreed to disagree on, on disease and plant nutrition, but very quickly George could see that there was a definite response to microbial activity in the rhizosphere and pH of the rhizosphere. That, that known area that most of us are aware of between six and seven seemed to be the, the sweet spot for having a better population of these organisms uh, that help the plant. In comparison of the two fields, the Hessel farm and the Glenny farm, where we were getting 300 bushel versus 150 bushel, we really didn't see any real diversification or change between the organisms that populated the bulk soil. Even in the rhizosphere in the early stages of growth, there was no significant difference between the two fields. However, shortly after uh, the plant started to grow, we started seeing up in the sap of the plant and the leaf of the plant a, a distinct difference in these populations. So about 30 days in, uh, after this plant's growing, we start seeing a slight shift in the, the uh, organisms in the rhizosphere. And then using uh, this TR, TRFLP technology, uh, we were able to group them. You can see here, this is the, the colony of organisms that actually populate the plant in the Hessel field. And this is what Glennies look like. Com completely two different colonies or different populations of organisms. So we look at how that progressed. At about 30 days, we start seeing that separation. By 60 days out, we see a real unique change in the population within the plant, in the stem of the plant, in the roots. Um, in the Hessel field, uh, the population was the same population basically we started with in the bulk soil. Really no differentiation, a lot of diversity, uh, and really no difference in, in, in what we started with. However, in the Glenny field, the complete separation of diversity, this plant is starting to, to select a very unique um, group of organisms and a much purer group of organisms started to show up in, in those plants. And that continued even through to 90 days, even more separation, and again, a more uh, unique colony of organisms. When we start looking at the bugs versus the, the, the soil chemistry, in the Glenny field, uh, for those who use our soil test and understand our, our nutrition philosophy, uh, Dean Glenny's field was in, in a perfect condition for balance of nutrients, particularly potassium and magnesium that we put a lot of uh, emphasis on. His phosphate levels were, were excellent. Everything was where I'd suggest somebody head for or try to um, move his soil to be. When you look at the, another place of Glenny's field versus Hessel's field, this field of Glenny's not quite as good as the other one, uh, but in comparison to the Hessel's field, quite a significant difference. Again, we want some place between 0.25 and 0.35 K to magnesium ratio to make things work. The other thing we got involved with is we are a, a distributor of the Sovita test for understanding soil microbial respiration. And from time to time, I've had some people call me and say to me, Greg, do these things, these, these Sovita tests, do they go stale? Or do they have an exp expiration date? And I said, not that I know of. Uh, why? And they said, well, I just tested my sand that has a lower organic matter content than my clay, clay loam soils with a higher organic matter content and my CO2 respiration or my microbial activity is greater in the sands. Uh, and can you answer that question? And, and I couldn't. I, I didn't know at that time what that was. But looking at all the data and what we did in this research, we always did a, a microbial respiration analysis on the fields. In this particular case, you can see here that Glenny's field has more microbial respiration than the Hessel field. And we look at the overall results here. This is one of those fields, 3.1% organic matter, and you can see the CO2 respiration here on this chart, versus the Hassel field at 7.8% organic matter and the typical respiration in that particular part of the field. And again, another one of Hessel's at 6.8 and 63 CO2, and Glenny at 2.9 and 70 CO2 respiration. So a sandier soil, a little bit sandier soil, but much difference, a greater difference in organic matter and still 
good microbial activity compared to the high organic matter. So there's something there that is more than just organic matter when we look at biological activity. So we look at you know what we're thinking here and the, 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 the microorganism's ability to actually help the plant take up nutrients and in theory plants have evolved over time and if bacteria in the rhizosphere could provide enough nutrition to grow a crop it would it would have happened through evolution. Well undisturbed this does happen. When we look at weeds Weeds have evolved over time with, without any intervention of breeders, and they have, they have, they have developed this phenotypic relationship with, with organisms in the soil, and they are much more effective and, uh, and better at taking up nutrients uh, with the use of these endophytes and bacteria. We've basically bred some of this out of our, our crops in our monoculture system, and we, may, we need now to redirect some of our efforts back to understanding some of this phenotypic relationship with some of the varieties that we're working with. This is just a, a slide looking at, in this case, micronutrients, uh, some of the crops that we grow versus weeds. And you can see here magnesium, a significant difference in weeds' ability to take magnesium. You look at uh, calcium and boron, and a special interest here of boron. Um, these organisms need boron, the plant needs boron to, to signal for these organisms, but boron plays a major role in, in just the physiology of some of the microbes we're talking about here. So now we've seen that there is something very significant about the soil health and the chemistry of the soil. Talking to Dean Glennie, I asked him, how long did you think that this actually took to, to occur? He said, with the proper uh, cultivation techniques, the proper um, management practice about five years before I saw a significant difference in productivity within that field. One thing we also identified very quickly is potassium had a big influence on, on uh, signaling these organisms into the rhizosphere and maintaining them. Um, so you know we started looking the direction towards what, what are these relationships. In our research work we took a number of sites around southwestern Ontario over, the, over those number of years starting out with you know, about 13 in the first few years and expanding later to about 40 fields across southwestern Ontario trying to gather the good and the bad areas. Uh, we used our drones to do a flyover to get a good end of the eye and then select the good sites to sample based on this versus the, the poor sites. So we had a, a good bird's eye view of, of the production of the field. Then our, our staff would go in and, and collect information and in, in crops or harvest crops from these areas and, and look at the differences. When we look at the profile of, of Pseudomonas in this case between the Hessel farm and the Glenny farm, a uh, very significant difference between the, the different organisms in that farm. So we're seeing some, some uh, differences in, in, in this case Pseudomonas. Uh, we look at the nitrogen fixtures in the good and the bad areas across these farms in southwestern Ontario. You can see in the good areas we have uh, more nitrogen fixtures in the roots than we do the bad areas. So something's something's happening to attract and nurture these nitrogen fixtures. We start looking at some of the soil chemistry and looking at yield across these fields versus our general fertility index and we start seeing these relationships. Uh, we look at the low producing sites in 2015 and look at yield versus K to magnesium ratio and there's some significance here but it's, it's not as great as we'd like. Uh, even yield versus percent saturation a little better significance, but you know, not huge. Um, again, this is a trend we saw on a regular basis with aluminum and corn. Uh, again, the low producing sites yield versus nitrate nitrogen. Um, this is what really became interesting to us. We really didn't see any significant correlation to yield versus soil organic matter. Now we know organic matter plays a major role in overall soil health with moisture retention and just the tilth of the soil, but it has, uh, its effect on yield uh, was really not that significant. Uh, we also offer on a new test a reactive or active carbon test and again active carbon versus just looking at organic matter there is some significance here on understanding yield versus active carbon. Again the low producing sites yield versus plant nitrogen um, the, the type of correlation we saw now these fields we looked at were low in one of the, and a lot of the micronutrients, but even in the low producing sites we did see uh, significance between th some of the micronutrients in, in overall yield. So we start looking at, at some of these relationships and anything that has anything over 0.5 is very significant. So with total plate count, 
Here we see that our, ge our general fertility index in this rhizosphere is significant with total plate count. Percent saturation of K has a real significance. Uh, nitrate, nitrogen, not quite as much with total plate count. Uh, even the GFI in our bog soil was fairly significant. And this one, uh, we follow through, uh, right through the data, uh, some significance here to boron. So boron of, of the micronutrients seem to have a, a greater significance than some of the other ones. And then again, we have significance here with uh, phosphate, and I'll show you where that actually shows up more in a few minutes here. And then the K to magnesium ratio, as we've talked about. So we're starting to see some real relationships, um, and, and now we have to start not just looking at total plate count, but you know who are they affecting and how are they affecting. So here we're looking at Pseudomonas. Again, um, GFI in, a, in the rhizosphere, in the bulk soil, very strong correlation. Uh, percent saturation of K, very strong correlation. But Pseudomonas is the only organism we saw that had any significant correlation to phosphate levels in the soil. And our thinking here is that the main function of all of these organisms is to solubilize phosphate for the plant to make ATP or convert ADP to ATP. And uh, in the case of Pseudomonas, them being a little bit weaker, our belief is, or our theory is, that they need just a little bit of a helping hand. So there was a, a little stronger correlation to phosphates or higher phosphate levels in these soils. When we look at the rhizobium, again, total chlorophyll content showed up, uh, but again, the rhizosphere, uh, general fertility index, percent saturation of potassium, not as strong as we would have figured, but it, it, it's there. Uh, nitrate, nitrogen, even the bulk soil, GFI showed up fairly significant. Uh, soluble salts or total salt levels, uh, nitrate, nitrogen, significant, K to magnesium, some significance, but here's where we saw the boron, and this is, again, this is about the only organism we really could correlate boron to, but it makes some sense to us with the research that's out there on legume rhizobium and the, the need for a soybean or alfalfa to have adequate boron levels in that plant to actually signal for the right phenotypic rhizobium to inoculate or draw to the, right, the rhizosphere. Uh, legumes also need good levels of boron in the plant just to maintain the, the, the um, rhizobium or the plant will actually kill them off, cannot not identify them as a friendly bacteria. So we're seeing this relationship uh, that we know has some relationship to other um, nodulating rhizobium, even in these, these non-nodulating rhizobium. So when we start classifying these into gram negatives and gram positives, we see that gram negatives versus yield, uh, there's, a, there's a correlation to gram negatives versus yield versus gram negatives versus uh, gram positive versus yield. Um, gram positives can actually be, be negative to the actual yield in, in any plant. The gram negatives versus our GFI, we see as our GFI goes up, our gram negative population, or the, the, what we call the real good guys, increase. Uh, when our GFI goes up, the gram positives actually decrease. And some of the results we've seen lately is we do believe that the, the plant, or we think that the plant, actually attracts the gram positives, being mainly the bacillus, to the rhizosphere to help the plant actually fight disease as they are, they are, they are crazy antibiotic producers. But as the fertility index goes up and the stress goes away a bit, um, these, grand, these, these bacillus actually die back and the pseudomonas and, and rhizobium actually increase. So yield versus GFI and low gram negatives, um, um, not a strong correlation. But when we look at yield versus GFI with high gram negatives, so the, the higher the yield, the higher the GFI, the higher the population of gram negatives. So there is a, a real strong correlation here. Yield versus GFI with very low, low gram positives. Again, here, when our fertility levels are low, we see this higher population of gram po positives, and we see the correlation fairly strong. And that's uh, where I was getting to when I, I mentioned about as the plant is under stress, it actually sequesters or attracts these bacillus into the rhizosphere to help fight disease. Yield versus GFI at high number of gram positives. Um, again, as our GFI fertility goes up, they, they, they actually start to drop off. So we look at these different organisms and we look at the gram positives versus gram negatives in the good versus above the average producing parts of these fields and compare that to yield. We start to see in these real strong correlations. And it helps us understand what microbial diversity is all about. The complexity of interactions between plant and microbial communities increase with microbial diversity. And 
up till now we thought diversity was was a great thing to have, but what this research is saying is with the higher the diversity, the more competition there is between the organisms and it actually negates both the positive or the negative effects of the, of the different species within this within this soil. The plant can only do so much and without the right fertility and the, the ability to 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 exude the right compounds, it can't support the entire population. So nutrient availability deter determines the endophytic survival. Endophytes prefer, prefer a specific carbon source. And that's that list I showed you of all those different compounds. When a plant is actually trying to attract a certain endophyte, it will actually secrete a certain compound to do that. Competition of these nutrients can be de a determining factor of the shaping of the endophytic community. And that gets back to the diversity of the population. And why in Glennie's saw we saw the population actually change and become a little purer population than the diverse population in Hessels. The plant is actually providing the right nutrient for that endophyte and it's trying to maintain that endophyte in the rhizosphere. And then again, specific nutrient availability may limit the number of endophytic microbes that can be taken up and survive in it with, inside the plant. Uh, so again, we need the right, the right nutrition to make that happen. So let's look at green manures as a factor in soil health. And we've all heard and seen lots of literature on green manures and how they benefit um, depending on the researcher and, and the crop you're talking about. Um, there's all there's some discrepancy about what is the best green manure. Well, let's look at what the plant's trying to do and, and this, this, this microbial population within the bulk soil. We now know that the carbon that feeds these organisms actually comes from the plant. And the plant is very selective in the organism it wants based on what it's trying to accomplish. And it gives off a certain carbon-rich nutrient to do that. Well, we plant the crop in May and we harvest it in September or October. The rest of the year, that, that soil is, is barren. There's nothing feeding that community. We put a green manure in there, and no matter how cold it gets, we still have a root mass in there secreting something. Um, it's feeding the microbes. So green manures maintain the health of that soil by feeding the microbes or maintaining that population that that plant actually tried to put in place. There is lots of literature out there that certain green manures fit better with certain certain crops we grow and we need, need to do more research there. But nonetheless, green manures will give you a benefit um, in any case for soil health and, and nurturing these plants. And that we've known that for a long time. So what have we learned? We've learned that the soil health and is all about soil chemistry. It takes a little while to build that chemistry up to, and to build the microbes as we move forward and main, maintain that. We know that there's some real relationships to different organisms and, and different nutrients, uh, some stronger than others. And when we look at these, we're starting to classify or categorize what organisms will exist with certain nutrients at certain levels to the point where we can almost predict what that community will look like without even doing or plating them out. So what we're focused on and what we call the key um, microbes that we want to look at are the nitrogen fixers, uh, rhizobium, we think, is, is, a, is a huge component here. A little weak in some of our soils because I do believe that there's more than just the, the K to mag and a base saturation relationship here. I think boron plays a major role here, and we just don't have boron-rich soils in most of our, most of our uh, trials, uh, something we want to look at. Again, pseudomonas, and again, how the gram-positives or the bacillus actually react and promote and stimulate growth um, and, and where they fit. So you look at all these different organisms in you know high productive area and a low productive area. You can see how that kind of like that's that plays out. Uh, again, we talked about the gram positives being the bacillus. Uh, we're seeing them higher again in the low producing areas versus um, the higher producing areas. It gets back to that that plant actually bringing them into the stressful areas to help fight disease. My theory, my theory only right at this point, but it, it seems to come out in spades with all the work we are doing. Uh, the nitrogen fixtures, that's pretty obvious. The pseudomonas, huge in productivity if we can culture that particular organism because, again, it's very sensitive. Uh, the rhizobium and, and then, again, the total fungi. We're starting to do more work here understanding the, the, the fungal population. So look at NDVI versus yield uh, predicted by GFI and percent K plus NDVI and, again, a very strong correlation. Looking at NDVI versus yield predicted by chlorophyll and biomass plus NDVI, 
uh, again, a very strong correlation. Uh, and then when we do our algorithm, when we put our predicted model together versus uh, the actual measured model, a very strong correlation to what our predictability is. So the soil health test looks like this. There's a, a bunch of information here. and We've tried to combine everything that the industry has been looking at that relates to soil health. Uh, we have all the chemistry we've talked about here on the top and, and rated based on how we rate it in, in optimum levels. Uh, we have the water extracted carbon nitrogen uh, pool here. Again, this is mainly used by people that look at the Haney report. And this calculation down here is also um, how you would calculate uh, soil health based, based on NRCS. Again, we include that in our soil health test for those people that have been using that and monitoring that. Uh, the Sovita test is very much part of our soil health test in the algorithm of predicting soil health. The reactive carbon is put on that test to help uh, growers understand. And, and where this plays a major role in understanding soil health is as we develop new management practices and move towards trying to do a better job, this is a better indicator than anything else uh, of what I, what I just did, did it help or was it negative? Because that will respond faster than anything else on, on a report. So it's, it's one of those things in there that kind of gives you a gauge in what you're doing. And then our soil health index, which goes from zero to 60. And it's an algorithm that um, we put in place based on all the things on this report, um, plus understanding the microbial populations from our research. We also have a residual soil chemistry index here that we, 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 uh, we offer. It's not part of the, the test itself. And it's from work we've done through this research looking at when we have um, issues with microbial populations, is the residual soil chemistry causing a problem with these microbes? So this is kind of a good news, bad news story. There's only a couple of groups that cause real problems to the microbial population within the soil. Uh, most of them are insignificant. Uh, if you have a low soil health index and even a high residual chemistry and even a low residual chemistry um, uh, index, uh, it could do some damage to your microbial populations. If you have a healthy soil with a high soil index, even with a high residual chemistry, uh, these bugs are very resilient and the chemistry uh, really has no effect on them. So that's a good news story for us. Concerned about overuse of pesticides, if we do a good job maintaining our soil, um, these microbes, these bugs can help the plant uh, and, and, and withstand the, the issue. So on this test, if your soil health index is not where you want it, you start looking at some of the parameters here, and you look at you know, K to mag, the GFI, the percent K, magnesium, calcium, hydrogen, sodium, and look at where that optimum range should be for that particular soil type, and if it's not there, you work towards bringing that within the optimum range and your soil health index will go up. Also included in there is pH, buffer pH, total salts, percent saturation of phosphorus and aluminum, nitrate, nitrogen chlorides, and potential mineralizable nitrogen. All play a, a role in overall soil health. So this, this test has been put together to help you understand um, if my index is not where it's supposed to be, how can I, how can I make it change? What, what can I do? And, and hopefully we've put this together in such that with a quick glance here, you can see which one of the outliers could be the, the main culprit and work towards improving that. We also have the Savita test, which is an absolute fantastic piece of information look for looking at uh, your potential mineralizable nitrogen, your overall activity. Um, you know, again, to complete Diversity can give you good Sylvita CO2 respiration, but may not necessarily mean you've got the right bugs there, but at least it tells you you've got a, a healthy environment. Reactive carbon, as I already mentioned, is a good tool to understand if we're doing something that might be negative in a cultural practice uh, point of view, as far as you know, how I'm tilling the soil, what kind of uh, uh, organics am I putting back, and then the soil health index, as we've talked about. Uh, with our soil health index, we also still supply the complete uh, information from the biological test using the Sovita test to give you some good information on biological quality plus CO2 respiration and mineralizable nitrogen. And, and this particular um, test, the Sovita test, is, is very much part of our overall algorithm in understanding soil health. This is just the same th thing again, showing you a poor, poor sample and again, where 
you would look at the, the K to magnesium ratio being very much out of whack here. We've got a, a low soil health index. Again, correcting that's going to help. It's also going to correcting the overall fertility is going to help. We've got excessive potassium here that's also causing us a problem. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of things here we need to look at to actually move that needle uh, in our soil health. So again, hopefully, if you understand the interpretation of the, of the report here, it gives you a kind of a, um, a something to point in the right direction to make it work for you. So what we're offering in our soil health test is a suite of different uh, tests available. Our soil health test, as we've shown you here, uh, again, the residual chemistry profile is optional, and, and it's uh, optional because it's expensive, and you, need, you only need to use that if you're really interested. But here we've got a whole bunch of different things that uh, are add-ons or piece of the whole puzzle, if you wish, um, looking at texture, water holding capacities. This is a new one. Again, we're starting to do uh, called the, the VAST test, which is look at, looks at aggregate stability. Very good test in looking at uh, overall structure of the soil. Uh, you know, water holding capacity, heavy metals, beneficial nematodes, because we have um, full capability of looking at nematodes here as well. Um, some of these other profiles we offered this year, we didn't get a lot of uptake. We're going to try to redefine this a little bit this year to make it uh, uh, easier to work with. But looking at the absolute root microbial profile, uh, taking your roots, getting your roots from you, extracting those endophytes from the root system, and, and looking at the sap of the plant and, and giving you a profile of who, who the, who's there, uh, what bugs are you nurturing, which ones aren't you, and hopefully, again, help you understand how you, you can move your soil into, uh, into a healthier soil and what to do. So again, we, we're offering quite a substantial amount of tools here to, to understand soil health. So in summary, um, what we've seen here is not that we haven't seen in a long time, uh, that balanced fertility provides consistent yields, um, but we're also seeing now that the fertility has a big impact on overall soil, soil health and sustainable ecology of the soil. Um, so, I mean, it goes hand in hand with, with improved productivity, but it's not about just using more, it's using the right amount in the right place and balancing that nutrition off so that plant can do a better job at sequestering and nurturing some of these, these organisms. So with that, I hope that I have provided enough information to stimulate some thought here, um, looking at using our soil health test in the future for improving on how you manage your crops or manage crops for your, for your clients if you're a consultant or in the retail. Uh, again, it's just more information uh, to, to gather to do a better job at producing a healthier crop uh, more sustainably. So if, any, if you have any questions, you know how to get a hold of us. Um, we have a number of agronomists on staff here that can answer these questions. We will be providing more information throughout the year at our seminars and some of our training sessions across Canada um, that we provide throughout the winter months. It will be probably a big focus on some of our, um, some of our seminars this, this winter as we're, we're still doing, we're still gathering information. We've got harvest yet to go through here this fall and all those farms we talked about. And we're looking at some of those unexplained um, issues, for instance, the boron and rhizobium that I mentioned uh, are something we're, we're looking into uh, right now to, to try to understand the relationship a little, a little better. So with that, I thank you for attending, and good luck.